Schultz and uh, Ricky. You know, you have. Yeah. Uh... I mean, you are really doing this very constantly, regularly. <laughs> okay, thank you, and we are live. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. Uh, oh. Today we are talking about the true ninjas. Now everybody knows. <laughs> everybody knows ninjas, right? It's so funny because when I was doing you guys' poster and all the gifts that come up, like for ninjas more than Yude. We talked about Yude last month. We talked about yokai with you guys two months ago. But when I did any kind of image search for ninjas, mm -hmm. it's so, 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 so many. So I think yes. of your three books, is that right? That ninjas is the easiest to recognize. Well, actually, the though, it was, the hurdle was kind of high because the big difference between ninja and yokai and yurei is that nobody knew what yokai and yurei were or very few when we started those books. And then for ninja, like everybody thinks they already know what a ninja is. So why do they need this? Yeah. If yeah. you search, um, if you type in ninja in Google and then actually the result is much higher, I mean, crazy higher than sushi. Yeah. So because of that, yeah, like Matt said, it's very difficult to um, to sell it because everybody knows, they, everybody thinks, I mean, it's true. It's a, uh, everybody thinks they know ninja, but it's actually, that's a Hollywood ninja. Yeah. yeah. It's not, you know, they don't eat pizza. <laughs> They're not turtles. <laughs> They're Japanese. So we want it to, um, you know, the ninja, that's one reason to know why. And then the second reason is that um, we do yokai, and then we are thinking to do this yurei. Ninja is a second book for us, but um, um, we wanted to do the yurei, but we wanted to do have a ninja because just like yokai and yurei, ninja is a big part of Japanese history and culture, so we decided to do so. But it's because, because you mentioned it, he mentioned it, ninja is so popular. Yeah. And outside, unlike yokai, so it's but it's but misunderstood, people. right? Like Hollywood has has redeveloped it in a new way. So today we're gonna learn about the real ninjas, the real <laughs> the real Japanese Fun. story. Uh, Nicholas Petas, thanks for joining. He says hi, ninjas. <laughs> hi, ninjas. <laughs> hi, ninjas. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, All so here. you guys. You guys want to just briefly introduce yourself? I know most people know you. Yeah, you you, you first. I'm Hiroko Yoda. And I'm Matt Alt. And you can explain. <laughs> and, and I can explain. Yeah. And we are the co-authors of Ninja Attack, True Tales of Assassins, Samurai, and Outlaws. And Ninja Attack is a little bit different from the normal ninja books that you'll often see out there. We are not martial artists. We do not have secret insights into ninjutsu. What we are hunting and cataloging are ninja as they appeared in Japanese history. And more importantly, it's this is ninja as the Japanese see them. So the, the we really wanted to make a point of not filtering the book through the lens of like the American ninja movies or you ninja only, magic, ninja magic. <laughs> yeah. You know, you only live twice. The James Bond movie. I mean, and those are great. You know, we love ninja movies and stuff, just like the next guy and gal. But you know, we wanted to do something that actually introduced how Japanese see ninja to the world, and that's what Ninja Attack really is. Um, and it kind of all started from this question of like, you know, Japanese people. Japan did not invent the concept of assassinating anyone or like sneaky behavior, but yet like ninja became the poster children for subterfuge all around the world. Like I think ninja is used in like it, it like it conveys in languages across the planet, you know, whether it's English or whether it's Chinese or whether it's, you know, Italian or whatever language you're speaking. Ninja has become kind of like a loan word all around the world. Mm -hmm. And that's really odd because, you know, assassin is that's that's something that. Yeah, you know, it's even Clinton. The, even Bill Clinton famously, Bill Clinton. famously in a, in when he was trying to take out Osama bin Laden, he said to his staff, "Send in the ninjas," meaning, of course, the special forces. <laughs> he didn't not actually the, not the man yes, with the black not the tur not the turtles, <laughs> not anything like that. He you know he used it as shorthand for what are modern ninja, which are like Navy SEALs and stuff like that. Wow. So it's interesting how that's <clears throat> this Japanese character yes. has just taken on this outsized, you know, kind of uh, uh, 
appearance in the world at large. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, Sarah Hodge has joined us from Facebook. She says, good morning. Your kimono is gorgeous. Thank love, you. Love this topic. And before yeah, we those start, are old. yeah. Um, oh, it's gorgeous it's kimono. Kaiso era. And my kimono is from uh, my great grandmother. So it's a perfect fit to talk about the Japanese history. <laughs> yeah, great. And on your book review on Amazon, you have some very famous people raving about your book. Do you not know this? This is amazing. You have Peter Laird, who's co-creator ah, yes. of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, he's the ah, co-creator. He's the co-creator of uh, the Turtles. Yeah, that's amazing. And you have Stan Sakai, oh, who yes. wrote Stan. Usagi Yojimbo. Yes. And he, you have some very famous fans who also, in their work, talk about ninjas and samurai. So very great. Yeah, that awesome. was really cool to get those uh, uh, those kind of jacket blurbs yes. uh, from from Definitely. so many cool people. And like mm -hmm. Takashi Okazaki, who who did Afro Samurai, yes, gave yes. us a really nice quote. I mean, ninja are everyone. Like, you don't have to explain them. You know, you could say, "Well, my show is start. It's 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 a ninja, but he's in X Y Z." Do you know what I mean? It's like it's the starting point. It's not the thing you build up to. So, it's uh, it's it's interesting to see how many different creators are using ninja in all sorts of different ways, whether it's, you know, people like Okazaki and Stan Sakai, whose, whose work is really amazing, or, you know, Naruto, the big, you know, anime that's been globally popular for mm -hmm. like a decade or more now. Yeah. Um, should we dive right in? You want to start? Yes. Always. <laughs> okay, so I have uh, to... Uh, Nicholas says, to from the Tokyo show, he says, no way, Afro Samurai is crazy cool. It is crazy cool. <laughs> it's crazy cool. Crazy cool. Yes. I think Samuel L. Jackson stars in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish it's we, actually yeah. black community is it was, it was responsible for um for to make the ninja famous. Yeah. And um so it's a it's yeah of course definitely it's definitely. Afro Summer is cool. Definitely. No, Afro Summer is a great mashup. That's really yeah. So cool. let's let's dive right in. So we have um we have a ton we have a ton of fun imagery that we prepared for this. So, so uh, uh, first, I've got the stereotypical ninja on a rope picture. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this is a really important. This is a really important one, and we can't actually see the images, so you're <laughs> gonna have to describe them it's to us. I will. So, I will. Yeah. It's it's hokusai. Ah, uh, it's hokusai. So um, so <laughs> this is very difficult because I cannot see <laughs> the, um the the hokusai uh the character. It's actually is it's uh, the first uh image that make ninja as a character. And that is a stereotypical, it's in a note that um, the ninja is wearing black clothes. And then um, that is actually the fit, uh, funk? no, the. But that was very new for the time up until that that, that image is from, uh, it's called Hokusai Manga, which is a really famous collection of what's basically clip art. Uh, intended for other artists to copy, but it became really popular in its own right. And they're just books of illustrations that Hokusai drew. And his drawing of the ninja uh, it was very different from any that had featured before. And he's dressed all in black, which is very kind of a functional sort of outfit. And that black outfit comes from... the Okay, the, it's come from... Hold on a second. Let me, let me uh, just keep, keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> The, uh, you we, have, the we have a computer problem here, so we're gonna open. That's we're gonna okay. open our own images here, and then so it makes so it, that we can. Does talk. it come from the puppet show where everybody is in black? I have that picture next. Yes. So that the, they are cloco, and then the black. How how do you, uh, how do you know the the uh, translate the cloco? Yeah, kuroko. It's like a a black clad individual, and you know kuroko are people who help out. They're like stagehands in Kabuki and the no play, the you know, puppet dramas. And it, it's a, a kind of convention. They're dressed all in black. Um, they look kind of like we think of ninja, but they're not. What they're designed to do is you're, you're supposed to ignore them. 
Um, when they dress like that, you're like, ignore this person. They're like holding up a puppet's arm or, you know, doing something behind, you know, you know how on a stage show, there's all sorts of stuff that has to happen to support the actors. And in Japan, this really interesting convention developed where people were dressed all in black and they're on the stage. They don't hide themselves. They're just dressed yeah. in black and you kind of edit them out. It's obvious. I, they are, you know, the, uh, the, those kuroko are, are in kabuki or, or, or the, the dolls that I put it up in an image. I it's especially I wanted to do this show this the dolls um the bunraku photo because obviously the the dolls cannot play by themselves. And then there are performers, the professionals. They wear actual official kimono and they play it. But there's little things in here and there they cannot do this alone. So so what they what so kuroko do are helping you know, the, the little stuff and that the performers cannot do. But it, they are dressing black. And like Matt <clears> said, <throat> it's a code. It's a, everybody knows these are invisible, invisible <laughs> people. Right. So the whole so so the what no Hokusai did was insert it uh inserted that black code into his drawing and then they make it a character because the ninja are supposed to be um quote unquote invisible behind the scenes, yeah. and then doing assassins. It's a kind of joke, you know, and, and Hokusai's work is full of kind of silly stuff. And of course it's full of serious stuff too, but there's a lot of jokey stuff. And so it's really interesting to think that this first like kind of seminal image of the yoka, of, uh, of the ninja climbing up the rope kind of started as a sort of caricature or, or fun. And it's the, the question is, so what did ninja look like before that? In Japanese history, they tended to look at, or in Japanese pop culture, I should say, uh, ninja tended to look more like wizards. They were dressed in really like resplendent kimono. Um, and I think we gave you some imagery Fun. like that. Uh, I've got the which... illustrated ninja next. Uh, okay. Uh, the next. illustrated ninja are actually the, um, the, hold on a second. Actually, let me show you. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know it. The, um, I guess we didn't give you this image, but there's before we, bef before, Hokusai came up with that image of the ninja dressed all in black. They looked like they were, they were ninja were, they were seen as wizards. They were seen more as magicians and uh, they would be dressed in beautiful kimono and they knew secret arts, but it wasn't really defined as a martial art. Like a lot of times ninja were seen as bringing these arts from abroad, from India, from mainland China and stuff like that. It could weave spells and magic and stuff. And so the, the Hokusai's illustration kind of is the bridge between those really early, early 1800s ninja portrayals and uh, bringing it more in line with what we know today as the the kind of stereotypical uh, black clad ninja. And actually, wait a second, uh, you do seven- No, the, it's because we- because... Seven fantasy ninja Jiraiya, do you have that image? Yes, yes. We have to talk about later. <laughs> if you put that, if you put that up- Yeah. If you. If you put that up, you'll one, see this is like kind of a traditional, and we'll get more into this illustration later. But this is what like a ninja looked like before Hokusai's illustration came along. And you can see this this particular ninja, whose name is Jiraiya, is, uh, and we'll definitely get back to talking about him later, is posed in front of a giant frog because that was his magic. He could he could conjure up giant frogs and toads, which is very different from what we think of as ninjutsu today. You know, subterfuge, sneaking around, assassinations. These guys were like superheroes uh, back in time. But we digress. We get ahead of ourselves. So That's really we're, interesting. We're, yeah. The illustrated... so... How... Yeah, Hokusai so, so why created... I wanted to say... Hokusai kind of created the image that stuck with the West, all in black and everything, right? Yes, because that's the part of the image. That's the first characterization of what ninja looks like. But uh, um, but we wanted to bring this ninja attack um, <clears throat> book to the world. <laughs> um, we wanted to show what ninja is in Japan. And then, uh, so what actual ninja looks like is dressed like farmers. Yeah, because in real, they are, in history, in history. In history, in history, in history. Ninja. Because the point is, they are spy. The information is power. It's information. It's one of the major ninja technique ninjutsu. So, um, 
So the, I, we give you the images of um, the farmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, three. Really farmers with the. Three uh, real ninja. Do you have that one? I've got, yep. A farmer wearing straw. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is like when you talk about ninja, it's important to to distinguish between ninja in fiction, which we've been talking to up about now, and then ninja in real actual history. And an actual historical ninja wouldn't have looked like somebody dressed in black or somebody dressed in beautiful kimono. They would have looked like somebody on the, uh, the average person on the street or in the field, as the case might be. So like when you think about ninja in in actual history it's much less about throwing throwing stars or blowing things up and much more about just kind of skulking around and picking up you know tips uh intel so more that like you could bring spy. back or sell exactly but but uh, but they are still still ninja after all so um so when i went to museum um uh, they show the weapons and you see um if the you know the images of the farmers that he has he the has um, some mm. looking kind of uh, the pole, pole. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> but in, inside you never know. Inside it's actually it's a, there's a hidden blade. Um, in a in a hat inside there's some you know uh, the, some some kind of the small you know um, the object that he can throw or you know or hurt people, or definitely I saw that um, the it's called kiseru. The it's pipe. an old farm. Of, yeah, the pipe. And actually, you can break it in half, and there is a small blade. And then, so uh, there's a little tricks in here yeah, and gimmicks. there. It was illegal. Yes. It was illegal to carry weapons as a, a, you know, if you weren't like a samurai, right? So, like, these guys had to carry things that they could say, oh, well, this is just a chain, you know, that I'm using, you know, in my in my work or whatever. And that's where a lot of these techniques originally developed from. Like the throwing stars, for instance, some of the very earliest throwing stars are, are like actual nail. They're, they're, they're devised from nail pulling devices, like to pull a nail out of wood. There's a hole. It's like a disc with a hole in it. And so those kind of evolved into something that they could actually throw. So there was there was that kind of, uh, uh, you know, th there was this subterfuge and gimmickry in what they did. But they weren't sneaking around in black clothes, at least most of the time anyway. You know, you kind of stick out like a sore thumb dressed like that, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, you, but you have another picture of a ninja climbing up a ladder, ladder in yes. this section. Let's, let's and it, he looks more like a, a typical so, Western yes. ninja, right? Yes, because they uh, those are um, – actually, you can see still the people wearing this uh, uh, indigo-colored clothes at, uh, at the temples. Yeah, know uh, that it's blue. It's not black. Yeah, training monks, um, the working monks, because those are those are working clothes, and it dyed with indigo, and indigo is indigo color. It's actually it's anti um, mosquitoes. It it protects from like bugs and everything, so it really makes sense to wear it, and it, because it's black and it's hiding and you know the hiding all the faces, it, it makes sense. And then also, I know I learned that uh, the black collar actually attracts um, the um, the murder hornets. A murder yeah. hornets. So yeah. <laughs> you don't want to wear black, like you know, in the in the in the bushes. But anyway, this is what, um, and that that's why I wanted to to show this because right next to the doll, there's an actual photo, and in these museums from um, Togakure-ryu. It's, this is in Togakushi. In, in Togakushi Nagano. in Nagano. So it's a it's a it's a it's a famous famous um the school of ninja ninjutsu. And um so it, this is actual if you want to imagine that you know the ninja what ninja looks like in a picture just switch it a little bit into dark blue. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually a museum that's in Togakushi which is a really beautiful place. Um, just in general, there's a Togakushi Jinja Shrine is a beautiful place to visit. And it's just a really nice area in Nagano Prefecture. A little tough to get to. It must have been really tough to get to back like in the Edo period, you know, in the, in the era of Warring States period. But they have a museum there now because it is the home of one of the not only famous schools of ninjutsu, but like the only kind of still extant living schools of ninjutsu. And I, still taught. and I bet you anything, the people who are um, outside Japan, people who are uh, learning um, ninjutsu from the ninja master, probably they know Togakushi because the, the, the Togakure, Togakure-ryu, 
that um, the Togakure School of Ninja is it's right now. I don't know, maybe he retired, but anyway, he's his famous um, master, Hatsumi Sensei, and everybody knows him. And so they, I, I bet you anything, they know uh, those people, especially they especially know the Togaku, yeah. Togakushi, but it's a beautiful place. Yeah, so it's where, one of the few. Where like, is it? Like, cool. Where is Togakushi? Nagano. 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 Okay. Yes. Nagano, Nagano yeah. Prefecture. It's, it's uh, one of my favorite places. Yeah, it's yeah. really it's nice. Beautiful mountains, it's, of it's course. It's a really beautiful place, and the museum is really fun. And uh, this, this actually, you know, the the guy climbing on the uh, the the ladder is one example. But Hiroko took. If you skip ahead to, for instance, um, number four, mm -hmm. Momochi Real Ninja. This is this is an actual like kind of chainmail suit that Hiroko that is on display there that Hiroko took a picture of. And Hiroko, why don't you tell him about the other pictures here? Why don't you put up the other? Yeah. Ones? So okay. So so um, I. So next, next I want to talk about the real ninja, mm -hmm. whose name is Momochi Tanba. And then we have uh, the illustrations from Ninja Attack. Um, he's, hold on a second, let me show you. That would be? That would be, I have to show Matt. No, I remember, <laughs> I remember what the illustration looks like. I just want to make anyway, sure that JJ um, puts anyway. one up. So anyway, so he is founder of famous school of ninja, a ninjutsu. Iga, Igaryu, Igaryu Ninja. Yeah. And um, and it's seven, seven or eight years ago, um, I went to. He was in America, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to the hometown where the you know Iga. A very Hiroko trip. I'm gonna go to Iga. Was born. So I went there in a Mie Prefecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I was told, no, I stay in the hotel with with a, um with the, all the ninja um weapons. They're donated by uh, the Momochi Tamba descendants, and then then so the pictures that you have um, <clears throat> in a screen, I believe, um, are from that uh, hotel that I stayed. And then one is that um, the what you call it? Armor. Yes, it's, it's chain, mail. Yeah, chain mail armor. Are we in number yeah. four? It looks like yeah, a beautiful area. <laughs> this, uh, this armor isn't from Togakushi. This is actually okay. from when Hiroko went to. So actually, before we get into this, it's really important for people to understand that there's like multiple areas in Japan mm -hmm. yeah. where ninja are associated with. Togakushi is one in Nagano, but another really and, and actually probably even more famous areas is Iga in Mie Prefecture. Prefecture, yes. And Iga is... You know, you'll constantly hear it referred to in Japanese uh, portrayals of fictional ninja. But it was a real kind of area that was really isolated and where the people there had to kind of they couldn't rely on the outside law and they had to kind of defend themselves. And over the generations kind of came up with this not only, you know, ninjutsu techniques, but also realized they could use they could sell them. They could kind of freelance them to warlords you know, in exchange for money and protection and all sorts of things. And the founder of the Iga Ninja School is a guy named Momochi Tanba, who Hiroko is talking about. And that's, you can see the illustration from the, our book is uh, for Momochi Tanba. Do you have that one up, the drawing by yep. Kondo-san? And Got so he, he was kind of like a, a ninja master. Like he would kind of, he wasn't somebody who would necessarily be out doing the missions himself. But he was the kind of orchestrator of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, the the thing is that um, when the, the when Japan was in Sengoku era, which is a warring state period, <clears throat> it whole it's it's a chaos, and then you know the the battles and everywhere warlords and then try to uh, to take the territory down. So, but you know, the, the Japan is not just a for samurai or warlords um there are a lot of farmers and normal people but you know but they are totally um get uh, the, uh got the damage from the battles because just um, just the warlords are coming in the horses and swords and then fighting i mean imagine you growing crops and uh, the rice and then all the sun go and then you just like destroy them all looting and and then probably get hurt or get killed and you know all the women and children are totally i mean it, it's it's a mess so so what happened was the farmers gathered and then they decided to we have to protect ourselves 
and the, and actually the, this mm. Iga school of uh, Iga school uh, did um, did a famous uh, de- uh, defense, and it, that actually that was a huge marketing basically. They the wars spread out, and the warlords like, oh, we can use those people, and then that's how it started. So okay, so let's go back to Momo <laughs> Okay, so I went to. So I went there. It was a very cold day, like uh, February, and then um, so that I stayed in the hotel that I said, and then um, and then I wanted to show you that real what real the ninja, real ninja, historical ninjas used, and then that's chain uh, the chain metal armor. That's one, and another one I wanted to show you it was um, the little jars. The little jars. It's written in English, of course, but it, those are donated by uh, descendants Japanese. too. In what did I say? You said English. I'm sorry, in Japanese. But it, uh, it says um, it's those are all ninja medicine. And if you read it, the very front is um, the it's the very in the front in the middle it says ahog ahogusuri. So maybe some kind of poison, but not to kill you, but you lose your mind. To kind of incapacitate you. Yeah, or the the, the sleeping medicine, sleeping medicine, sleeping medicine, sleeping, medicine, sleeping yeah. drug. Yeah. Um, you know the deep sleep drug, and the back there is the, uh, the poison to kill. Yeah, to there's kill. A, the middle one says dog killing poison. So like, there's all sorts of these little poisons that you would carry around, or like a poison to put on the tip of your arrow. Um, and there's like different levels of sleep. You know, so this stuff was like, how, 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 how efficacious was it? I'm not exactly sure. We're not exactly sure, but that these are vintage and they were, uh, they're on display there and are said to have been owned by this family who's still living in, in the area. They're, they're like the, the lineage, I, they're not ninja anymore. These people are probably working as like stockbrokers or like, you know, something these days, but they're, you know, they preserved all of this stuff in the family house and then donated it to the, uh, the, the museum, uh, the, the, in the place. Yes. But note that saying. those are all, um, quiet kill or quiet tools. It's not like just go there and go, that's a warlord job. But a ninja that's be there behind the scene. Um, then this is one of the example, the quiet technique. That's so interesting. We have some comments. Uh, Nicholas sure. says, Hatsumi Sensei is a living legend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Wendy Bigler joining from Facebook says, fascinating. Thank you. And looking forward to the book. Thank you, Wendy. Excellent. Thank it's, you. It's, it's out. It's been out for many <laughs> years. Many years. <laughs> please, please, Thank you. please, please buy it. So Momochi. Yes. So um, so I don't know if you have that um, the the actual photo that I took in the village. Oh yes. Yeah. So <laughs> no you can, can see, see it. <laughs> okay. Momochi Tamba Iga Village. Yes. Is that so? That's you... snow covered. Yeah. Snow covered village. Yes. 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 But the, he said so. I first I have to walk valley very narrow path it's all mountains <laughs> i just imagine just i'm all by myself and it's just walking that's me but anyway and in all the sun I, this is what i saw and then it's it's very difficult to capture by photo but the iga town the where the momochi tamba was born was locates in valley the you know the ha- the housing are just like re- it's, it's co- the villages are covered with mountains, so it's easy for warlords coming down anywhere and it's stumping around, and it's, so it's it's just even though the houses are modern and it probably the number got increased maybe but I but mountains never change, and so so I was really fascinated oh this is it, <laughs> and then. People told me that there is, like Matt said before, there's an actual house um, for the Momochi Tamba's descendants. And if people live there, of course I cannot knock the door because it's not a museum, but I thought like, oh, maybe I should check that out. Okay, that's a pre-iPhone for me. I have only just a phone, so no internet. And of course I missed it. <laughs> and then I went to the, another deep mountains. But the funniest thing, I, I uh, stumble across, or I mean, I found graveyard. That means, that means I was almost go through the villages, but you know, the graveyards is normally, especially the old ones, it's, it's border between 
in, uh, inside village and outside village. And then, <laughs> but like, and then I found out that, um, I don't know if you have a, uh, could you put that the graveyard? It's called Momochi Tamba's grave.jpg. Is that a should, little blue sign? No, it's the one that's, With the it's wood? for Mom it's it's the graves, the uh, stone the stone graves. You actually, uh, I think, have it had it up. Did I? At any rate. Anyway, so uh -huh. I, oh, I got it, I got it. Yep, the graves. Yeah. So um, so there's one lady there, and then I was kind of lost, and I started talking to her, and then I said, "Is that?" And it actually, that's a grave for Momotamba, founder of Iga. School, <laughs> ninja school. Like, oh, I guess I came from Tokyo to say the respect and prayer to Momotsutamba. Anyway, so uh, the, to make the story short, and then I walk around and I even stumble across that um, the moment uh, the Iga school, um, no, the ca castle base. Yeah, so Hiroko was hiking in the hills and got a little bit lost, and she found this like old shrine. Yeah, deserted like and deserted falling shrine. apart, and which I had no idea, but I couldn't pass it. I just couldn't leave it, and so I was like, I went up to it, and then I found a little sign at the bottom of the falling yeah, apart I see that a little blue, shrine. Yeah, blue tag, and the little blue tag says Momochi Tamba's Castle Ruin. Yeah, so it's, he, it he also known. No, uh, he's he's also <clears> known <throat> as Momochi. Sandayu. So that it's the same person. It's the same, but different name title. Anyway, it's like, wow, I found, not only got a I have a grave, but I also had a base. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so of course, you know, the, all the, the things are gone. So that people put it, that um, the shrine yeah. to venerate it, but it, because it's a deep, deep, uh, kind of uh, far away from the village in the, in a mountain, in, inside of the mountain forest. So it was kind of it was a uh, falling apart. So I cleaned it. The up. Hiroko cleaned up the shrine. You know, but this is this is an example of a word that you hear a lot in fictional ninja stuff, which is kakure zato, which means kind of hidden village, and it's still used in modern pop culture. Like Naruto, uh, the anime series, makes a big deal about these hidden villages. This place that Hiroko went to is an actual one of those. I've, of course, now it has the internet and there's like you know yes. roads going in, but imagine 400 years ago it didn't. It didn't at all. You know, it was surrounded by mountains. Yeah, because it's a ninja base. <clears throat> he has a house, but there's a ninja base. Yeah. And of course, ninja base has to be surrounded by a deep forest. Yeah. And I found it pretty cool. That <laughs> so. is. That's really. And it looks like a beautiful place, too. Oh, to yeah. I mean, these places yeah. are always, you know, one of the great things about, you know, researching ninja or researching yokai or whatever is it gives you kind of an excuse to go out to these like really out of the way locations that you might not go to otherwise. And um, yeah, like Hiroko has certainly taken me on a lot of crazy adventures out to places <laughs> where we're looking for some shrine or, you know, some, you know, leftover. And in this particular case, Hiroko is like at this shrine and she actually found, um, ah, if you go right, back right. to the, you actually have the image at the bottom of the screen right now, the log. Underneath the log, look at this. This is like a smoke pot, we think. We, I have no idea. Maybe this is they vintage from the base. This is left over from Momochi's like stronghold. It's a stone pot that could have been used it's for obviously mixing. Obviously it's a man-made. Yeah, maybe it was but, used for mixing those poisons. That's possible too. <laughs> you know, you don't know. You don't know, but it's it's a fact that you know, that's a, that's a ninja tool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and Hiroko just stumbled across it in the middle of the woods at this like abandoned shrine. So that's like a really cool moment. Um, and, and the kind of stuff, you know, much more so than learning ninjutsu and no offense to people who are learning ninjutsu. That's really cool. If you are, we're much more interested in this kind of like archeological, history, sociological, culture. historical, uh, aspect of it. So this is like a really cool thing when Hiroko showed. Now I want to go Hopefully not when it's snowy, <laughs> and go <laughs> and go see this myself. And so, so, but you know that actually, um, the you can you don't have to go to. I went to the middle of nowhere <laughs> to search for the ego, but um, actually, you don't have to go to the middle of nowhere if you, uh, but you can still see stuff in Tokyo. And yes. I want to move on Good to segue. <laughs> move on to the famous ninja. Hattori Hanzo. Yes. And uh, Hattori Hanzo, 
is that actually it's a name. It's not a name. It's not a name. It's a title. Right. So there are many Hattori Hanzos. It's it's passing along. You would inherit it. Inheriting it. So if you say, I like Hattori Hanzo, we have to talk. Next question, next question would be, which one? And then the famous uh, Hattori Hanzo, the ninja, is a Hattori Hanzo the second, which we introduced in our book, nin uh, in the Ninja Attack. And you can see in the illustration from Ninja Attack, it's kind of uh, Kondo-san, who's our manga illustrator, who also loves Ninja, did a kind of joke with him. It's almost like a dance number because Hattori Hanzo is not the kind of guy who would sneak into a castle. He's the kind of guy who would organize the guys who would sneak into the castle. He had, it's, it's the head of this ninja clan, for lack of a better word. And he organized basically an army, like a private army. Um, it was outside of the control of the warlords. And then what happened was after um, the assassination of Oda, Oda Nobunaga, Nobunaga in 1581, uh, it caused, obviously, he was the leading warlord in Japan at the time. It caused a lot of chaos. And at the time, a guy named Tokugawa Ieyasu, who you may have heard of, uh, was one of his retainers and was basically in the crosshairs. He knew he was going to be killed next. And Hattori Hanzo, he contracted basically with Hattori Hanzo to spirit him away from uh, the Kansai region where he was in, Kyoto, and that sort of area, Osaka, where he was in, and get him to safety. And this was uh, a kind of rescue mission called Iga Goe in Japanese, or the basically the Iga mission where they took him through Iga because nobody knew it like they did. Nobody could get in there and got Tokugawa to safety. And as a reward for that, Tokugawa basically made Hanzo, Hattori Hanzo, one of his big retainers. And to the point where after Tokugawa unified Japan in 1600, <clears throat> at the Battle of Sekigahara, and established Edo as the new capital of Japan, and obviously a castle there, because that's how you did things at the time, one of the gates was known as Hanzo's Gate, Hanzomon because it was closest to Hanzo's house where he lived and Hanzo would so regularly commute to the castle and be kind of uh, Tokugawa's, uh, 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 you know, kind of man on the ground. Actually, yeah, what is so that? Edo, he said capital I'm... Edo, it's just, which is Tokyo today. Yes. And Ieyasu's castle, which is Emperor's palace today. So the gate he was talking about, the Hanzo Mon gate, if you go to if you go to the the Japanese emperor's palace, not actual living compound, no, but a historical cr uh, ground that we can go, you can see. And, <laughs> and there's actually a train line. It's, the it's Hanzo Mon train line. line. And then that's um yeah, so that's Hanzo Hanzo, Mon Hanzo yeah Hanzo mm. Mon Station, Hanzo Mon Line. That actually came from the famous ninja Hattori Hanzo the second name. That's so, so a cool. ninja runs through Tokyo. That's awesome. We've got some comments. Tova says, cool. Just ordered the book. My kids are big ninja fans. Thank you, Great. Tova. Nicholas says, wow, that's awesome information. I never knew yes. that Hattori Hanzo is a kingpin kind yeah, of figure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually, I mean, he wasn't a criminal, but yes, he was, <laughs> uh, you know, like in Daredevil. Uh, but yes, he is a, he was certainly an organizer type guy. And unfortunately, he, it, it, it must, it must have killed him uh, that he died before the battle before, of Sekigahara, yes. which was the big battle that unified all. He, he died of supposedly natural causes uh, before that, but he was like Tokugawa's strategic advisor and tactical advisor. And uh, I think it's safe to say that without Hanzo, probably Hattori Hanzo, Tokugawa would not have succeeded uh, or not as easily as he did. And then maybe um, we wouldn't have, maybe we wouldn't have Edo. Yeah, maybe capital, we wouldn't even we have, have Tokyo. Tokyo. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a history right here. And then also um, another thing we wanted to share is that Hattori Hanzo's spear. Oh yeah. The you know Matt is laying on right next to That's it. That's the one. Oh, it's... Uh, Matt Matt lying down. I got it. I got it. Okay, yeah. so that was that that image was taken during the filming of Japanology Plus, the show that I used to co-star on, and there was an episode about ninja, and uh, they sent me to a temple in Tokyo that actually Sainenji Temple. Sa yeah, it's Sainenji Temple. Sainenji Temple that actually has Hattori's spear. 
on display and you can see it there in the in the kind of tokonoma with me <laughs> and they used me as the <laughs> yes. it's just note that it's very long and uh he's 180 centimeters high so it's longer than him and <laughs> it must have been tough to you anyway so that spear is over 400 years old it was it was given from the tokugawa Ieyasu, the later on later on he became shogun <clears throat> um to hattori hanzo and it, at the sign it, it, uh, the temple not only had this hanzo's um spear but also there's his his, his grave is there so if you want to respect him um you know uh, just visit there and then say yeah. You know, yeah. the prayer for quietly. That'd be That's really so, nice to his history. So interesting. Should we move to Basho next? Yes. yes. So yeah, this is an interesting one that most people would not consider linked to ninjutsu or ninja or anything. Possible ninja. But in <laughs> Japan, it has long been rumored that Matsuo Basho, the famed master of haiku, um, he famously did the, uh, the, the haiku that even a lot of Westerners know, the uh, Furu Ikea. Kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto, um, you know, listen as a frog jumps into the pond, uh, the stillness of the ancient pond. I think this is, I don't, I can't remember if it's a Seidenstecker's translation or what. But anyway, Matsu Basho is known as this gentle master of haiku, but he famously wrote this book called uh, The Narrow Road to the Interior, uh, Oku no Hosomichi. And it's basically a diary of his travel are going uh, from Edo uh, and up into the Tohoku region and then coming back down around again, a kind of like circumnavigation of Japan. And it's a really amazing document and it's a really cool thing. And he actually traveled with a companion named Sora. And the, what, what, the in really interesting thing is, is that his diary of the trip and Sora's diary of the trip do not match. Leading some people to speculate that Basho was concealing what their actual activities were, which they passed through many major, you know, kind of strongholds of Tokugawa allies, and that he was actually watching them and reporting back on them to the Tokugawa shogunate. And this is also bolstered by the fact that in the, one of the ways that their that their diaries do match up is that they were making incredible time. They were really speeding to these places. Yeah. In like, it's like a ninja speed. And there <laughs> is an actual ninja technique for walking very quickly or run. It's like now we know it as kind of the techniques marathoners use or like speed walkers use, but back in time it was seen as a kind of secret. And it seems like Basho and Sora might have been using some of these techniques to make the time they were making around Japan. Yeah, so I couldn't find the map in English, but the map that I, uh, I gave you um, is it's actual the uh, the map, the walking map in um, where the Basho and the Sora walked for, uh, and it's famously known as uh, the narrow path to the interior. So it started, it start, it says, <laughs> that's basically Edo. In Tokyo today and then the first stop, stop was Nikko which is famous you know that Nikko Toshogu is a the gorgeous shrine. temp you know the temple shrines and well the Nikko the Toshogu that I have on the you know the, the photo is venerated it's venerating Tokugawa yes that's the first shogun um in 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 the Edo era and then, um, but when Basho was around, of course, the Ieyasu was dead, but the descendants, you know, the followers, inheritance, sh inherited shogun, it's running, that, running the shogunate. it. Shogunate. <laughs> shogunate. <laughs> but that, um, anyway, so has he said that, you know, the whole, more, uh, the whole purpose is keeping shogunate for Tokugawa family in order to do so, to make sure that other warlords are weak. And then one of the technique that Matt, Matt mentioned is that um, the, there's a famous strong warlord in the Sendai area, which is Date clan. Uh, so they, so what Tokugawa Shogunate did is tell telling Date to um, what more contribute, contribute and to Toshogu. In, 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 not, not innovate, uh, the, uh, the fix the Toshogu. Yeah. 
the temple so that they can lose huge amount of asset. I mean, you can see it, how gorgeous so that it's is. It's like an honor to be asked to maintain Toshogu Shrine, but it is a massive, massive financial drain. So this is the equivalent of the white elephant, uh, yes. you know, the proverbial white elephant, where you're giving somebody this really honorable sort of recognition, this prize, but it, it costs so much to upkeep, it actually bankrupts them, or at least keep, in this case, keeps the dates. they can't use money to organize against Tokugawa. Yeah, and then, but the the, the thing is that, um, so the, because, the, because of the, because he's at uh, the Basho's path was Nikko, and then they go to the go to go to the Sendai area. That's where the Date clan's territory. So that's that's one hint. One hint. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing is that um that so when the first day, the first time that the first day that they went to Nikko together, the Basho and the Sora, they wrote haiku. But Sora haiku, the weather says beautiful sun. But Basho. <laughs> <laughs> the haiku is pouring rain. So it's like, wait so a second. already they're not matching they, they're up. Not, they don't match. So it's like, there's also, the rumor says that, oh, there must be some kind of code. And that's, and then that's, that's another one. And then the, another one is that um, the dates don't match. And then also Basho and the Sora, I think the Sora was, it was born in an Iga school uh, yeah, Iga, yeah, territory. I mean, Iga. they are close to Inga Ninja school. So we don't know, but there's a rumor that maybe Basho is ninja, and that's why we play like, made it. You know, our illustrations are really playful. Like if the ninja, if the Basho is a ninja, maybe he has some kind of hidden blade. And, and well, it's just <laughs> awesome to think about. I mean, Basho, Basho is already this like awesome, you know, haiku <laughs> master. So he's obviously a very talented, intelligent guy. So like to think that he's also this sort of James Bond type character of of ancient uh, Edo is is just really uh, a kind of romantic and cool thing. And that's this is exactly the kind of stuff that we wanted to put in the book. It's not something that's really widely known in the West, but it's kind of known to those who know in Japan. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of rumored about. I, I don't even think if the average person would know this, but it's definitely something that's been <laughs> talked about. Yeah. And so this is exactly the kind of cool, really cool, not really well-known abroad stuff that we wanted to introduce in the book. And really, uh, since we're running low on time here, I think we should jump really to the cool. next thing, which is yeah. Um, if you see, we're going to get fantasy? back to how Japanese saw ninja in their own fantasies. You know, we have our fantasy of ninja in the West as the black clad dudes in pajamas and dudettes, you know, running across rooftops and like blowing things up with smoke bombs and like fighting Navy SEALs with swords, you know, but that's our fantasy. What the Japanese fantasy was, particularly before Hokusai came along, is the ninja, as we were talking about, as a sort of sorcerer. Yes. And the first superstar ninja character in Japan uh, emerged in the very early 1800s and was known as Jiraiya. And there's a black and white illustration from the very first book. It's called Seven Fantasy Jiraiya Woodblock Print 2. That wasn't the Japanese name. That was our name. Uh, <laughs> and this is actual woodblock print from one of the early books where uh, uh, Jiraiya first made an appearance. And uh, do you have that one? I'm looking. I don't see it. Oh, it's, yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yep. Blow that baby up. <laughs> And so, uh, so basically, this is this is how this is this is Japan's first superstar ninja character. Jiraiya was a kind of um, he's he's known as what's in Japanese a kizoku, which is a kind of an honorable thief, which was a type of character, a type of character. Like a Peter, not a Peter Pan, a Robin Hood type individual. Peter Pan, that would be. Yeah, Peter, not Peter Pan, no, <laughs> Robin Hood, and Jiraiya's ninja move was conjuring up giant toads like giant phantom toads who he could use to do battle against his arch enemy who was named Orochimaru. And uh, his kind of semi, his frenemy, uh, the princess Tsunade, whose ability was conjuring up giant slugs. <laughs> and the in the books, <clears throat> frogs can defeat snakes, which is what Orochimaru can conjure. And slugs can defeat frogs. 
and in this kind of junkang paper yeah, rock the scissors, paper, type, scissors thing. type of thing. So you can imagine kids of the era must have thought this is really awesome. And you can imagine them playing Jiraiya and stuff like that. And Jiraiya spawned this whole kind of mini industry in Japan of the early, the mid Edo period. There were kabuki plays based on him. And that's the, the actual, um, the woodblock print with the beautiful toad in the background. Yeah, the, because the note also, no, it is, it's notable, the note that, um, that those familiars are very familiar uh, living things in, in our daily life. Like, for example, when we worked on a ninja attack in Jiraiya, I walked outside, there's a huge frog in front of me. I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it just, you know, so it's for kids. It's easy. Yeah, to especially play back with. in time. Yeah, I mean, slug. Oh, it's, that, there's, so yeah. So it's, a, it's I can imagine that kids love it. Okay, so in then go on. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, it's just, no, exactly, because it's key, you know, it's basically, they didn't have, like, branded toys back then, but, you know, any kid could find a toad and a snake and a slug and, you know, start to play. <laughs> yeah. It's basically the equivalent of action figures back in, in the day, I'm sure. But anyway, the, the really interesting thing about Jiraiya is he's not just a historical fragment. He came back as one of the key characters in Naruto, the anime series. Um, and that's how most people know him today, uh, especially, you know, younger folks, you know, mm -hmm. teenagers and young adults who grew up watching Naruto. And many of them undoubtedly thought that Jiraiya was a character uh, made for that. And Tsunade is in there. Orochimaru is in there. Um, and yeah, none of them are original. And it's really what well, the, the portrayal of, of them in the show is, original. is original. But like, the concept, concept is, is old is borrowed from and so naruto naruto is kind of the shrek in the sense of how shrek <laughs> ties together all of these old you know puss in boots and like you know the gingerbread man like all of this kind of stuff the muffin man who don't have any connection to each other except that they're folk tales uh, naruto was this kind of character who ties together all of these old ninja stories for modern audiences, and it's really cool. I mean, that's similar to how Kitaro ties together all of the yokai in Gegege no Kitaro. He's a character made by that artist, Mizuki Shigeru, and Naruto is a totally a creation of the artist of that series, whose name is escaping me right now. Mm -hmm. But it's just a really cool way to bring all of this old stuff and make it relevant again. So this is this is a way that ancient ninja, really like 200 years old before the black clad ninja became famous, have sort of you know, come back to life in the anime era, kind of coming full circle since they were sort of the first famous yeah. characters to begin with. It's classic of us. We talk too much. Um, do you yeah, you I love know. it. No, no, I love it. I love it. The the only comment I was going to make is, so when they played Junk and Poe back in the day, did they say frog slug and something else? I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, we don't know. We, we That's a good don't question. Know. Yeah, That's but I'd like to play that one. Frog, yes. so it would be frog, slug, and what else? So it's a so uh, Jiraiya conjured up toads or frogs. Uh, Tsunade conjured slug. up slugs, and slugs. Orochimaru conjured up snakes. Yeah, Ooh. Orochi means so snake. Frog, so. slug, snake. I like. That. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but if you say the words yeah. without any characters, it's kind of gross. Yeah, I wonder how. I, I, I mean, should say gross, but it's just kind of a. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people who watched the Naruto cartoon are just like, why is this guy have toads? Like, what does that have to do with anything? You know, why? But, why? But you see it. You see it in Miyazaki yeah. anime. You see the yeah. frog theme come up. Um, so this kind of stuff is is just gold. Thank you so much. Mary has some great comments. She said, "This is why history is so awesome and interesting to me." Yes. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mary. Let's let's move on to eight. Thanksgiving. Uh oh, it's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So let's talk about ninja food. <laughs> yes. Can we talk about ninja food, Hiroko? Let's talk about ninja food. Yeah. Yes. So that uh, basically, um, because ninja are assassins, I mean they are hiding and they cannot go to the restaurant, so they <laughs> so they, they have to the carry their own store. food, and and, and the, the 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 image is. Um, the page it came from our book Ninja Attack. Um, it those are ration, and then look, those are all dried. I mean, dried hard. <laughs> and yeah, even, so the ninja biscuits, the katayaki. The katayaki actually you can still you can still eat 
today. They're sold. They sold. Um, it's a hard baked um uh, cookies. Yeah. Anyway, it, it, it's 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 actually it's, it's for me. Iga, it's for me a brick fixture. So, I we ordered it. And they're <laughs> we, good, but oh God, they're good, they're but really really hard, right? Super hard. I, I mean, mean, it's it's it's. Its name is Hard Biscuit, and yeah. oh gosh, it is hard. And also, that and Hard Biscuit, Katayaki, is the hardest cookie in entire Japan. They're proud of it, and it's so, so you true. You have to just suck on it for a while until you can eat we, it, maybe. We did. We put it in the tea. Yeah. But it just then, it just flavor's gone. But it, it even it came with um hammer, which yeah, is not working. To, yeah, a little a little mallet, like a little wooden mallet. And it's we're not like, working. What? And so and we're, we're trying, like we couldn't even break it with this thing. We're like that, trying to, we're hitting it. It's like a hockey puck. It's not that, that thick though. They're thin. They're thin, but and they taste good. But it's just they're hard. Wow. And so yeah, and I told my friends like I bought katayaki, and then some of my friends like, oh, that's my grandma's favorite. And right. I said, grandmother. Is your grandma a ninja? How how she can eat this hardest thing? So so we just suck, started laughing suck on and maybe it, maybe maybe yeah maybe on it. Is, we need a fake you know the uh, teeth to break it. So it's but the hard. point is you can and, buy this ninja. And also you can, you can, umeboshi combat rations umeboshi the honey yes, pickle plum. The really Dried and shriveled. You know, because you, 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 there are actually, there, there's a very dried ones as in addition to kind of the wet ones, which are what most people I think eat on top of their rice these days, but they're, you know. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, there's a funny story that I can share, share with you. Um, my, my great, my great aunt who passed away over 20 years ago, but my, my, fat, my um, relatives, it's so, uh, this year decided to, to re renovate, renovate. renovate. Anyway, I mean, we built the house, so they had to remove the all the stuff away. And they found a jar of umeboshi, the pickle that my, gra my great aunt made. She she made it 20 years ago, okay? And well, she passed away. Uh, she passed away 20, away 20 years oh, ago, that been... over 20 years ago. So it's all shiver lap. We are so scared, but it's covered in salt. And then and it was, it's like, okay, so well, five or six of us. Like, Did you eat yeah, it? Okay, this, the ones together and then okay we just shared a response that's you're supposed to be the scariness but anyway hiroko doesn't drink but alcohol helped for me anyway yeah. we put it in we didn't we didn't get sick that's the power of it but oh did God. you fall asleep was it one of the ninja potions no you did oh, not fall asleep you know we did? Salty. It, was, it was a salt bomb that's what it was but it, it, <laughs> It proved like wow, that's a yeah, yeah, that's a ninja ninja ration, you know. Like yeah. you don't have to carry it around over twenty years. It just probably yeah, you need it like funny. half an year. Yeah, and hopefully you're not <laughs> carrying it around twenty years. But it's a umeboshi and then, plum, plum. And then the last one, the hoshi e, the dried rice. Yes. Yes, that's that's um, it's just really hard. And then it basically you just put it in water, and then they soften up, um, and then eat it. But, I guess um, in in Western cultures it would have been the jerky, like what like what tack? what so. what cowboys would carry, what kind yes. of ration? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, like because dried, the jerky. dried fruit or dried meat, right? But yes, that's it it's all a lot it's all vegetarian. All that were the ninjas vegans? Were they following the Buddhist diet? I just don't think meat was super widely consumed back then. Right. Yeah, because yeah. that's that they uh they found that that's a but they think they thought that's a barbaric matter. But the thing is, the thing is still that um the you know the people in the coastal mountains and they they hunt. Sure. So they gave them um they gave them different name. Yeah, there's euphemistic names for meat in Japan from Edo era, like for instance, uh inoshishi, which is uh, wild boar, is called botan, yeah. right? Which is peonies. Mm. And uh, uh, and so there's like a, there's a botan nabe, which is peony nabe, is actually wild boar nabe. Yeah, ne uh, the or... deer deer is uh, momiji. It's a, yeah, momiji. Um, maples. The maples. But also, you know, the Japanese, as you know, that we have uh, what's it called? The count counters. Counters. You know, the book is isatsu, nisatsu, sansatsu. Animals, ipiki Animals, yeah, ipiki nishiki, right? Anyway, back in time, birds are okay to eat. So they gave, so they gave um, rabbits. They are four legs. That's animals. Like, ooh, that's a major no, no. But they call, they use uh, the the same carnivores as bird. bird 
So they, they're supposed to be birds, so it's okay to eat. So it is a lot of if you hang around, but it, in, in general speaking, um, the eating meat is just, it's a kind of a sort of barbaric thing. Um, wow. That is interesting, yeah. isn't it? That was a way around it. Uh, Wendy yeah. says, is there an alternative to Amazon for your books? I want all four. I'm in Japan. And it looks like it needs to ship from the U.S. I think Amazon oh, no, Japan no, 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 has no. it. Amazon, right? Amazon.jp will have them. Kinokuniya carries them. Any, any. any they're, they're they're published by Tuttle, so they're available. They should be available wherever fine books are sold. Um, but certainly mm -hmm. Kinokuniya will have them, and Amazon.co.jp will, and yeah, Tuttle might even have. I don't even know how that works, but they could definitely be ordered here. It's no problem. Okay. So check contact out us. Amazon, JP. Contact us if you can't find them. Okay, and that you can contact them via Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Um, there's or just also a yourself up like a ninja. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's also a question from Patrick on Twitter yesterday who couldn't join today, so he wanted me to ask. He said he okay. lives in Kumamoto and he researches folklore and yokai and pop culture. And his question is, how would you compare the ninja boom of the 60s in Japan to the 80s boom in the U.S.? Uh, that's that's an interesting one. And I see somebody here in, in uh, YouTube. Nicholas is asking what the title of the book is. Can you put the can you put the image of yes, the yes. yokai attack cover up? It's yokai. I'm sorry. It's ninja attack. True Tales of Assassins, Samurai, and Outlaws is the name of the book, and it's published by Tuttle. Um, so yeah, the, the 60s ninja craze in Japan was launched by manga, uh, and more specifically, gekiga. Uh, like, for instance, uh, the illustrator, the manga artist, uh, Shirato Sampei, mm. who had a really, really massive hit series called uh, Kamui, which was really popular among student activists at the time. And he he produced, his works were actually a not so subtle critique of capitalist Japan in which the samurai who had long been seen as heroes were treated as oppressors. They, and the, the peasants, the, the, the uh, farmers were the real heroes. And ninja were this kind of like dark force playing the two sides off each other, Yojimbo style. Uh, these kind of lone wolves who couldn't be predicted. Very cool stuff. Um, unfortunately, not a huge amount of that has been published in English. Um, a, a kind of later version that was is uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, which is uh, a, a kind of reaction to Shirato Sanpei's stuff that came out in the 70s and is about a, uh, an, a former shogun's assassin who in his little boy, he has to go on the run and they're always fighting ninja and stuff like that. So Japan had this very different sort of thing. And when those manga were discovered by Westerners, it kicked off this entire transformation of the American comic book industry. And when I was a kid in the 80s, basically this was a, a time period when all of America's superheroes or many of them were being re-envisioned as ninja. Suddenly Daredevil, who is the blind... Uh, kind of superhero from Marvel Comics is, oh, well, he's a ninja. You know, he's kind of running around at night and, and fighting, you know, the forces of evil. And Frank Miller, who was in charge of that at the time, actually started having him fight ninja. If you see the Daredevil series on uh, Netflix, he's literally fighting ninja, which is a holdover from that 80s era. I, I'm, Batman, sorry. I'm sorry, Batman as another example, The Dark Knight another Frank Miller kind of uh, reinvention. He's seen as this kind of ninja type character. So that was like a big, and that fueled the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that fueled, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is actually a parody of Daredevil um, in its first incarnation. And so you had this whole kind of American comics fueling into the, the, the B kind of grade movies, American Ninja and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, the yeah. basically in the 60s, um, um, the, the, well, I, I'm not going to repeat myself, but he, because he explained it well, it, it's just all action based, like, uh, sort of like a jidai geeky. Yeah, like, a, a, yeah, samurai dramas. Samurai dramas for kids' version. I mean, yeah. adults, young adults read them too, so I don't want to say kids, but it's, it's, that's, that's how it is. But to stay that way, um, 80s, I can't tell you what happened, what, what, what portrait, what the treated ninja stuff in the 80s in Japan. I didn't care, <laughs> okay? 
But when I went, when I did, when I went to um, America as an exchange student, um, and when I was in high school during the eighties, I th that that was the time period when a Ninja Turtle was famous, and I got really stunned by it. So in, in the eighties, uh, there was basically the ninja a florist by uh, um, by Hollywood. Yeah. And actually, this is an interesting thing. Do, do you know, this is this is a question for you. Do you know what the first like kind of portrayal of, of ninja in the in Western movies was? I would say, I mean, I was watching Zatoichi, the blind swordsman, right. when I grew up in Hawaii. So he would he was a samurai, but I would see something like ninjas. That was a Japanese version. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's would, actually would, a seminal yeah. moment. I don't know. It is <laughs> James Bond's You Only Live Twice. That was That's the, right. and this is actually a really interesting anecdote, right? So You That's Only right. Live Twice is set in Tokyo, which was really kind of um, avant-garde for the time because Japan was still seen as an enemy, you know, a kind of fallen enemy. So to set a James Bond movie in there made it even more exotic in, in what was a, being rapidly rebuilt Tokyo. When the producers flew to Tokyo to do location scouting, they delayed their flight back by one day because they heard that there was going to be an exhibition of ninjutsu. I think it was at Yasukuni or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they actually canceled. They just didn't get on their airplane and decided to stay an extra day. They saw it and they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. We need to put this. What a perfect enemy for James Bond to fight in the, in the movie. And they did. But the really interesting thing is if they had not canceled their flight, that flight actually crashed right out of oh uh, Haneda Airport. It killed everybody. Oh, so gosh. So there's an alternate reality wow. where the entire James, probably the James Bond franchise would have ended there. It wasn't n nearly the massive kind of success wow, that it was. Wow, yeah. saved. Yeah. Saved by so the ninja. Ninja saved him. Yeah. yeah. Was That's that the awesome movie story. that they make, the James Bond uh, yes. dress, like, he turns Japanese halfway through the Turn movie. Turn Japanese. They put some eyebrows. He looks like Mr. Spock. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, what I saw, I was like, really? I mean, he's still stuck like. Yeah, it's it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, up, it's but... the late Sean Connery. I, I think there is a book here for you guys talking about how ninjas portrayed in movies and Western cultures. That would be a nice follow up. Well, there's yeah. actually in the, in the last pages of Ninja Attack, this crazy, we drew this crazy chart showing how yes. all of the films and books and things influenced one another. So in response to the question of how those, we actually, it's, it's set up the booms parallel in Japan and the West. And uh, yeah, there's, because you also have to talk about the whole martial arts boom of, yes. of, of like, you know, when Bruce Lee took off in the early 70s and, and that sparked sparked karate kid there's uh, pink yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. there's so many yeah. connections right to ninjas yeah. yes. Japanese and we can't we, culture. Can, we cannot discount israel's contribution because all of those american ninja movies are made by golan globus which was an israeli company uh oh. targeting uh uh the west and uh yeah it's just it's there's so many ninja mm -hmm. are everywhere they've they've literally <laughs> ninjas they've anywhere. escaped japan <laughs> yeah. and like kind of yeah. snuck into all of our hearts worldwide. It's uh, That's probably that the biggest awesome. ninja trick of all. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights today. That was so fun. As usual, Matt and Hiroko, you guys are experts on deep <laughs> Japan history and culture, folklore. Thank you so much. Well, thanks thank for letting so us much. dominate This your is like task. the first time for us to talk about a ninja. So thank you, JJ. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Let's do it again. I want to follow yeah. up. Thank you so much. I think okay. there's a lot, a lot more we could talk about. Thank you, Absolutely. everybody, for joining. We had people on Periscope, Facebook, and, and YouTube all adding comments and questions today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, awesome. Next week from Tuesday, we'll start a new week. So thank you. Have a great weekend. Everyone take care. Thank you, Matt and Hiroko. Thank you.